our next speaker is um, Jackie Michelle. So she's a geochemist um, and the president of Research Planning Incorporated. So um, Barrett mentioned RPI, and that's um, who Jackie works for. So Jackie, um, let me just make sure everybody can hear you in the room. So can you say something? Okay, I'm going to talk about the 2000 Echo oil spill in Patuxent River, Maryland. Okay, perfect. Okay, I think everybody here, take it away, Jackie. Okay, um, we're going to, this is a great case study because it was a range of very intensive to um, sort of natural recovery uh, approaches to shoreline cleanup, and then we, we were also very lucky we got some funding to go back and look at seven years later. So this was 120,000, 126,000 gallons of a mix of number six oil from a um, uh, which was to a power plant. Um, they were using number two fuel to clean out the pipeline, and it was a, a release right inside the marsh interior. And we had some pretty strong winds that pushed into other wetlands, and therefore we had to deal with some very aggressive cleanup in some areas. And I must admit, this was not a Coast Guard cleanup. It was this one of these little lines where it was on just, just on the EPA side. So this was managed by the EPA. So here's the spill location. And I kind of want to show a picture of it. This, this is the, uh, the pipeline here. You can kind of see it, the corridor. And you can see, well, I'll talk about three kind of areas. This is uh, one area that was a lot of treatment done. This was some treatment. And these areas over here on the far left were um, uh, little to no treatment. Okay. Okay. So uh, you know this is the opposite of the Deepwater Horizon. This oil did not weather you know one second before it hit the wetland because it, it, the break occurred. You can see where all the repairs being done to the pipeline went right into the marsh. Now Barrett said talked about in situ burning. Wouldn't this be a great in situ burn case? What do you think? Only problem, what are these long lines over here over the wetland? Can you see those? Yeah. Those are the power lines to, that provide power for all of the um, eastern Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> so we couldn't um, burn the, uh, the wetland there because, uh, you know, a million people would be without power. So the EPA decided that they had to go in, because this is a very area with a very low um, tidal range. And so there's not much tidal flushing, and so they had to create a lot of uh, trenching. And you can sort of see how intensive this. I mean, this is a very intensive treatment. I very seldom seen something like this before. And the oil was very thick inside there. I mean, this was almost a centimeter thick inside the wetland, getting trapped in there. Amazing. And so um, with so little water flow, they had to use to kind of create their own uh, high volume, low pressure flushing. So they dug these trenches to, to, you know, to, to be able to push the oil down to areas for collection. Lots of trenches. And so um, you can see in the upper part of this photograph, you can see where all the trenches were. Well, they could get access to this other area a little bit to the east by putting out boardwalks. And so in these cases, there was no mechanical flushing. It was mostly all, you know, sorbent uh, recovery using hand tools. And so these guys are, you know, sopping up the oil really thick on the surface. But there's another part of the area where there was, you know, no access. So, you know, they could get to this side, but not to here and not to another area. So look at the, this is the furthest to the east. You can see that they all came into these little tidal channels and sort of into these big areas, you know. And so what are these little dots here, you think? Anyone? Those are muskrat huts. And so look how the muskrats had eaten all the vegetation of the sinus sororities area, and so the oil just kind of covered on the surface. So there was, uh, um, you know, so how, there's no access to this area. Can't get there by boat hardly, you know, much less with, um, in a small boat, much less a crew. So no, no cleanup was done in those areas. And so we, um, uh, we worked with the uh, trustees and to do the natural resource damage assessment. And so here's some spots in the, in the, shore, the shoreline oiling for the Spartan alternate floor. You know, the, the shoreline oiling uh, we talked about, it's pretty, uh, you know, gets a lot, little bit more uh, flushing and wave energy, and that vegetation came back pretty quickly. We all know typha or cattails, they're hard to kill. They're, they're almost harder to kill than um, uh, uh, frag. And so that came back pretty quickly. But what did not come back quickly was the interior areas with, that were heavily oiled with the sinus sororities. You can see some of these pictures. These pictures are from uh, July 2000, September 2000, and then July 2001, one year later. 
So um, I'm, I'm showing this slide just to, you know, someone, some folks went out and did some, uh, try to collect some samples and look at spent the communities, and you know there was an, a, a, a replicate of three, and so you can see here that there's very little power when you have a, an area that has so much variability. I almost rather have no data collected rather than have, you know, uh, very poor power data. But it does show that in the right after this bill, you know, the amphipods, which we know are most sensitive, you know, were knocked down in all the habitats. But in um, in the areas of the Spartina, you know, after one year, it started to come back. So, um, but none of these data were significant. So here's some, you know, people love pictures a thousand words. So one thing that they did that was really important was that since there was so much physical disruption to the wetland, you know, as a part of the response in that area that was trenched, um, the RP uh, added it, which is very important. So here's you can look at the, these little two stacks up here on the left side of the photograph. There they are again. And so um, you know, it looks pretty good from this perspective. And so there's pretty good vegetative recovery where they planted. Here's another picture um, in July, one year later, pretty good recovery. One more. You know, um, but we essentially they backfilled the areas with clean sediment. So these plants were growing in clean sediment. But if you go out in the areas outside of where their where their area was replanted, you can see that. The, and and even one year later, you can see blobs of liquid oil. Because remember, this oil did not weather any; it went straight into the marsh and into the soils. And so, um, so one thing that people talked about was that you know, they want to use, oh, let's do nutrient augmentation. Let's put some fertilizer in the marsh. But most marshes are not nutrient limited; they're oxygen limited. And so this is some work that was done part of the response where they, they applied nutrients from helicopter and, and you know, over a period of several weeks, multiple applications. And this is the total pHs. And essentially the ones with the red triangle are the ones that were not treated with nutrients and the other ones are. And you know, they, the whole pattern is the same. You know, the, the, the total concentrations were pretty high. You know, we're talking over between 1 and 2,000 parts per million pHs. So there's pretty heavy oiling in the wetlands there. But then um, so, th so one thing, there was a natural attenuation. There is some flushing, you know, from rainfall and tidal flushing. But look at the, this is the weathering index. So, the, so the, these, these points are all on the same line. You know, there's no weathering. Once that oil hit the marsh, and this is just in the top five centimeters, you still don't have any, um, after a year and a half, there was little to no change in the oil chemistry. And so we went back in 2007, seven years later, so we looked at the uh, vegetation condition, we looked at above and below ground biomass, we did sediment chemistry and some uh, sediment toxicity tests using amphipods. And so you can sort of see these two, you know, these, all the little uh, yellow dots are our stations. We didn't do the, the replanted area, but this is, you know, so the, a lot of these areas were um, not, had not done, undergone much treatment. And uh, we wanted to have a lot of power, so we did analysis. We looked at the, what kind of uh, number of replicates we had to have. So we had 12 replicates in order to be able to overcome a lot of the uh, natural um, uncertainty um, and variability, and especially in the below ground biomass. And we took the scores down from the order of 10 centimeters and then 10 to 20 centimeters. And essentially, um, what we found was that in Spartina, there was really no difference between the oiled and unoiled area, but the sinus sorority. Um, the alternate flora was, but the sinus sororities had about a 20% reduction in below ground biomass in the oral area seven years later. And that's probably due to the relative amount of biomass in the, in the rhizomes versus the, um, the above ground vegetation, and also their, their roots are a little bit deeper, and so they were in the oral area a little bit more. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sure, is Ed still there? I know he's some you know, pH histograms. And so in the lower right is the, uh, is the spilled oil, that's the fresh oil. And this is, and on the lower left is the sample seven years later from 10 to 20 centimeters in some uh, sinus sororities habitat. And you can see the pattern is very similar. You know, that it's, it's, it's weathered a little bit, but not very much. Whereas, you know, these ones on the top are areas where there's lots of mixed oils, and that, so that's not nearly, um, uh, you know, the surface soils were, had much less um, oil and weathering, I mean, more weathering than the deeper soils. And then if we look at what we there's a, a technique where you can sort of say, okay, well, let's just look at how many, what's the relative loss of, of pHs in relative to the fresh oil? And because this is like the opposite of, of deep water horizon that went 5,000 feet of water and then 100 miles shore, you know, so this red line in the middle shows that the oil, you know, had lost about 60% of the pHs, and those are mostly the, the volatile ones, but then over seven years, none of that changed a bit. You can see the top line is the naphthalenes, those are the semi-volatile ones, but the green line are the uh, three-ring pHs that are, you know, are not uh, lost by evaporation and, you know, they're, they're, most of them are still there. 
even after seven years. And then um, the toxicity for, uh, when, you, when, when you take samples to do toxicity, you know, they, they take it and they homogenize it and everything else. So it, it's very different than how oil occurs in a marsh soils, which has a lot of cavities and oil penetrates those cavities preferentially. So these data are always a little bit hard for me to interpret because they're, um, you know, they're, they're so mixed up. But, but essentially, you know, with uh, around 100 to 150 parts per million total pH is when we started showing toxicity from, uh, to anthropods. And so, again, to wrap up the time series photographs, here's the site in April 2000. One year later, uh, in um, the summer of 2001, you can sort of see the evidence of the trenching that was done. And you can see over on the left side, there's some still open areas. But by fall 2004, now four years later, um, you can already tell, look, 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 all the muskrats are back, right? See those little circles, those are muskrat huts. So and, um, the vegetative, it looks, it looked pretty good, though there's a lot of subtle differences, um, you know, when you do some more detailed plots. But overall, from a, this perspective, the, the habitat recovered amazingly well, considering um, the intensive treatment that was done in the um, area right near the break. So lessons, lessons learned. When you do aggressive methods, it's really important to start replanting as soon as possible. It's part of the response. We, we, we have really pushed for that. It's not emergency restoration. You know, you dug up the marsh and you have to restore it as part of the response. Interior oiling has a lot slower recovery because of those lower natural removal processes, especially if you have a little tidal range like they have in the, um, in the upper Chesapeake Bay. Weathering rates really decrease with depth. I mean, they essentially go to zero. Oil penetration is not uniform, and so um, uh, I think the secondary permeability in the root cavities can cause effects to the plants because a lot of times the oil will penetrate those root cavities, and so um, it doesn't really reflect the concentrations of oil that the plant's exposed to you know, at that most important um, interface between the soil and the root. Nutrient augmentation is only needed when nutrients are limiting, and most of the time it's oxygen. And I, I really think plants are pretty tough. I mean, um, they can survive as long as you don't do, you know, too aggressive um, methods that, um, without replanting, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I was very impressed at the recovery. That's it. Great. Thank you, Jackie.